by the 1960s, our progress with accelerators had produced a menagerie of different particles, our particle zoo. And that put particle physics into the same position that chemistry had been about a hundred years previously, where there had been lots of elements, but no structure or pattern to how those elements could be arranged. And the solution that we needed was the same as the solution chemistry needed back in the 1860s. We needed a periodic table for the particles. And that happened in 1961, when the physicist Murray Gell-Mann spotted a pattern in the mesons and the baryons. And what he did was he arranged the mesons into an octet, a group of eight, and he arranged them by their electrical charge and something called strangeness. Now, strangeness was a quantum number that was associated with the strange mesons that had been discovered back in 1947, not a uh, measure of how weird the particles seem to be. Um, so the mesons were grouped into this octet, and that octet contained mesons and antimesons. The baryons, or the light baryons, were also grouped into an octet, um, but differently to the mesons, the baryons had an octet and the antibaryons had a separate octet. So there was two octets for the baryons, uh, one for the baryons, one for the antibaryons, whereas the mesons were together. Now, uh, by this time, heavier baryons than just sort of the neutron and proton and associated particles had been found. There were things like the delta baryons. And so these, Gell-Mann uh, realized, could be arranged by the same sort of criteria, but into a set of ten, into a decuplet. However, there were only nine of the baryons discovered that he could fit into this set of ten, and that allowed him to make a prediction. And the missing baryon from this set of ten he named the omega minus baryon, and it would have a strangeness quantum number of minus three, and because of the structure of the masses, as you went down the diagram, the masses increased in uh, fixed steps, he made a prediction for the mass of this missing omega baryon. And three years later, in 1964, the omega minus baryon was discovered, and it had a mass that agreed with Gell-Mann's prediction, and it had a strangeness quantum number of minus three. So Gell-Mann's eightfold way clearly worked, the problem was, is just like the early periodic table, nobody understood where the structure came from. Now, just as we finally understood the structure of the periodic table, when we understood the structure of the atom, understanding the structure of Gell-Mann's Eightfold Way would take an understanding of the structure of mesons and baryons. And in 1964, Gell-Mann, in collaboration with Zweig, came up with a model that purported to do exactly that. It was known as the quark model. And in this model, there, was three quark, there were three quarks, up, down, and strange, and these were bound in quark-antiquark pairs to form mesons, and that's why the meson octet had the antiparticles in the same octet. And for the baryons, it was three quarks bound together. For antibaryons, it was three antiquarks bound together. And that's why the baryon octets were separate. Now, this was a very appealing model. It seemed to work with the, uh, seemed to explain the structures of the Eightfold Way. One of the caveats was it required fractional electric charges. The down and the strange quark had to have a charge of minus one third E and the up quark had to have a charge of plus two-thirds E to make all the charges of the mesons and baryons work out. The other um, issue with the model was that nobody had seen a quark. Now, when we, you know, if you look at a, a hydrogen atom, we know there's electrons in there because if you hit it with particles, you can kick electrons out of the atom and you can see the atoms. If you do that with mesons and baryons, you were never going to see uh, a quark, and, and there was no evidence at the time that these quarks could be knocked out. So there was a big question mark over, you know, if these quarks exist, why can't we actually produce them? Why can't we knock them out of the mesons and the baryons? Um, 
However, the model was fantastic at explaining the particle zoo because what it now said, because you had bound states, if you excited the, the bound state, just like you can excite an uh, electron in an atom, you get another particle. Now, the reason we think of it as another particle is because the binding energy of these quarks was a lot, lot greater than the binding energy between an electron and a proton. So, if you excited the quark-antiquark -quark pair in a meson, then the mass of the meson would increase by an appreciable amount, and so there we observed it as a completely different particle with a different mass. Whereas, of course, if you excite the electron in an atom, the change in binding energy is you know, a million, well, a billion times smaller than the mass of even a hydrogen atom. So it's not noticeable. But for mesons and baryons, it was very noticeable. Um, you had a very large increase in their mass. Now, the other problem with the model was trying to explain the delta double plus baryon. This had a spin of three halves, when, and quarks have a spin of a half, so the quarks had to be all in the same uh, spin state, and the delta double plus baryon was made of three up quarks. So this meant that all three quarks were in the same state, but quarks, like electrons, obey the Pauli exclusion principle, so this was a problem. So to get around this, the model suggested that there was something called a color charge. And quarks could have one of three color charges, red, green, or blue, and antiquarks would have color charges of anti-red, anti-green, or anti-blue. Now the model said that for a bound state, it had to be overall colorless. So for a meson, that would mean, because you've got a quark and an antiquark, it would be something like red anti-red, or green anti-green, and so on. For a baryon, you had to have one of each color. So you had to have a red, green, and a blue quark, and just like the colors they were named after, those, of course, when you mix them, produces something that's white, or in other words, colorless, and so those states would be bound, just like you know, anti-red, anti-blue, anti-green would also work for the anti-baryons. Now, I should state here that Color is simply a label. There is absolutely no suggestion that the different color charges reflect different wavelengths of visible light. Um, that's simply not the case. Um, all it was is a convenient way of thinking about these charges, these quantum charges, um, just so that it gave you the right sort of picture, um, because you needed to think of mixing the red, green, and blue together to get something that was colorless. So quarks don't actually have physical color, it's just a label that we apply for convenience to the charges that they can have. So the problem with, so, so the quark model solved a lot of problems. It explained the structure of Gell-Mann's uh, Gell eightfold way. It explained why we were getting this huge menagerie of, of, of particles. Um, uh, but the problem was nobody saw a quark. And because of that, nobody believed the model. Now, the first evidence of quarks started to emerge in 1969. And in that year, the Stanford Linear Accelerator, which was an electron accelerator, started a series of experiments um, on electron-proton scattering. So this was firing high-energy electrons at protons and measuring the scattering cross-section. Now, for a structureless proton, you had something akin to sort of the experiment that Rutherford did, just on a smaller scale. You can imagine the proton as sort of like the Thomson's Christmas pudding model of the atom, just sort of a lump of amorphous charge. And so when the electrons um, have enough energy to penetrate that, they would be deflected a little bit, but not by much. Whereas, if the proton starts to have, has a structure inside it, then just like Rutherford saw with the atom, you'd start to get a uh, different scattering cross-section. And what they saw was a huge deviation from what was called the elastic scattering cross-section. So, the elastic scattering cross-section is when the proton scatters and remains essentially as a proton. What they saw was a far larger momentum transfer, and the plot that you can see here is plotted against something called Q squared, and Q squared essentially is a measure of the momentum that's transferred from the electron to the proton. 
and what they saw was a many many order of magnitude deviation from the prediction that you know if, if a proton had just been a uniform blob of positive charge um, you know they were getting a massive deviation from that prediction and this was clear unambiguous evidence that there was structure inside the proton and that was completely consistent with what the quark model predicted because of course the quark model predicted that a proton should contain three quarks, two up and one down quark inside it and so there should be structure there. Now it wasn't clear confirmation of the quark model but it was confirmation that protons had structure. So now we have evidence or had evidence that the proton had a structure. And the scene was now set for what became a revolution in particle physics. It took another five years, but in November 1974, two independent research groups on opposite sides of the United States simultaneously came up with a discovery that shook our understanding of particle physics to the core. Both of these teams found a new meson. One named it the J meson, the other named it the Psi meson, and since the discoveries were simultaneous, we now call it the J Psi meson. That meson had a mass of about three and a half times that of the proton, but it had a lifetime a thousand times longer than Gell-Mann's eightfold way predicted. And the reason for that, or the only explanation there was for that, was that this was a new type of quark. They had discovered a fourth quark known as the charm quark and suddenly the evidence for the quark model went from you know suggestive with a structure to overwhelming. It was the only explanation anybody had to explain this result. Nobody could explain it any other way than there being a fourth quark. And in fact, a fourth quark had actually been theorized before because there was a bit of a pattern between the leptons, and the leptons are things like electrons and the muons, and the electron neutrino and the muon neutrino that by 1974 were all four of these were, were known to exist. And there were only three quarks. So people had suggested, well, maybe there should be a fourth quark to match up with the number of leptons. Not a very strong argument, I will admit, but nevertheless, there was the suggestion there. And this result confirmed that there was, beyond any doubt, a fourth quark in existence. This immediately produced literally overnight adoption of the quark model as the structure of matter. And the shift was so um, you know, profound that it became known, because it occurred in November, as the November Revolution. Now you might think, after such a monumental paradigm shift, has happened at the end of 1974, there'd be a bit of a rest in discoveries, but that was definitely not the case. Only the following year, in 1975, a new type of lepton was discovered, the tau lepton. So this was a heavier version of the muon and the electron. And its decays suggested that it came with a third flavor of neutrino. Now, although the tau was discovered in 1975, the tau neutrino was not confirmed until the year 2000 by the donut collaboration. And the reason for that is that taus have a very short uh, decay time and you need to have a very intense beam of tau neutrinos, which means you need to have enough energy to produce taus that will decay or things that will decay to taus. And having got those tau neutrinos, you need to have a detector that can operate in very, very small distance scales because when the tau neutrino interacts, it produces a tau which only goes a very, very short distance. And so it was a very difficult experiment to make and that's why it took so long. But by 2000 at least, we had confirmed three flavors of neutrino. But things didn't stop there. In 1977, a fifth flavor of quark was discovered. And this was known as the B quark, where B, depending on who you uh, talk to, either stands for bottom or beauty quark. And the discovery of a fifth type of quark meant that there had to be a sixth quark out there. 
because of something known as the gym mechanism and we'll discuss the details of that later on. But there had to be a sixth type of quark but that wasn't discovered until 1995 at the Tevatron uh, Collider at Fermilab by the D0 and CDF experiments and the reason that took a long time is because the top quark has a mass of 172 GeV and to compare that to the B quark which had a mass of only uh, just under 5 GeV there was a huge gap there and that is still unexplained to this day. Nobody knows quite why there is such a huge gap between the B quark and the T quark, where T in this case, again depends on who you talk to, stands for either top quark or truth quark, although I think top quark is probably the most popular one. So at that point, we had our structure of matter, and in fact, we also, since then, have got, or well, in the 1980s, we had evidence to suggest that there were only three generations of leptons, and that came from the LEP experiment, or well, LEP collider, um, where uh, the Aleph experiment on the LEP collider made a measurement of um, the something called the Z boson, which we'll talk about in a minute, and looking at the width of that Z boson, how it sort of decays, um, they can show that it only decays into three different types of neutrino. So electron, muon, and tau. If there was a fourth neutrino flavor, then it has to be more than half the mass of the Z boson. And that would be phenomenally unusual because that would mean we'd have three flavors of neutrino that have got masses that are so incredibly low we can't even measure them. You know, and we're down at sort of the electron volt level, at least for the uh, electron neutrino. And then we'd have this fourth generation, which has a you know 45 GeV mass or higher, right? So, you know, we're talking nine, ten orders of magnitude difference, at least. So, that, not impossible, but highly suggestive that, at least at this point, we have got the basic structure of matter in terms of quarks and leptons um, pretty much understood, and we're not expecting there to be more than three generations. So, at this point, we need to turn and talk about the force carriers, the bosons. Now, the first boson to be discovered, the first force carrier, has already been, we've already discussed it. It happened back at the turn of the 20th century, and that was the photon. And that transmits the electromagnetic force. The next boson that there was clear evidence for was discovered in 1979 at the Petra accelerator, and there they observed electron-positron collisions that produced jets of particles. And those were produced when uh, electron-positrons collided and produced a quark-antiquark -quark pair that went out back to back and produced the, the quarks produced jets of particles. But what they observed was that in some events there was a third jet of particles. And the only way to explain this was that the quark, or one of the quarks, was radiating a gluon and the gluon was the, is the boson that transmits the strong force, the strong nuclear force. So those three jet events were clear evidence that gluons existed. Now, the one uh, force that remained was the weak uh, nuclear force. So this is the force responsible for beta decay. Now, uh, there was a model for the weak force um, that came about uh, from Glashow, Weinberg and Salam and they predicted that there were three bosons that transmitted the weak force. Two W bosons, which had one had a positive charge, one had a negative charge, and a neutral Z boson. Now, the charged bosons were necessary to explain many of the quark decays, indeed they're necessary to explain nuclear beta decay, but there was no evidence until 1973 of the neutral Z boson. And in 1973, there was a bubble chamber experiment at CERN. So this was a hydrogen bubble chamber. So you take liquid hydrogen and you put it in a chamber with a piston on it and you yank down on the piston to depressurize the hydrogen at the same time as you fire a neutrino beam into it. And 
when the particles interact, uh, you can see the tracks that they make. They make tracks of bubbles because the hydrogen wants to, to boil. Now, of course, today, health and safety would never let us build a liquid hydrogen bubble chamber because any leak or diffusion of hydrogen, and hydrogen diffuses really well, becomes highly explosive in air. So, fortunately, they did it uh, while we were still allowed to do experiments like this. And what they discovered was that muon neutrinos could kick electrons out of atoms without converting into a muon. And the only way that can happen is if there is a neutral weak interaction. And so that was the first evidence of the Z boson. However, all of this was indirect evidence. And to really show that W and Z bosons exist, you have to produce them. And that was a problem because the mass of these particles were around 100 times the mass of the proton and no accelerator at the time could get to the energies needed to produce them. What we needed was a very clever idea. Now, to make W and Z bosons, an easy way to go about this, instead of using a fixed target experiment, where you know no accelerator at the time, or certainly in the late 70s, early 80s, had anywhere close to enough energy, um, the way to go around it would be to make a collider. The problem is, is making a collider would be incredibly expensive if you were trying to collide protons on protons because you'd need essentially two separate beam pipes and two separate systems of magnets and microwave carriages. Essentially, you'd be needing to build two accelerators, one on top of the other. Now, a way around that would be to use antiparticles. But as we discussed when uh, talking about accelerators, if you tried that with electrons and positrons, positrons were very easy to make in large quantities because they were so low in mass. Um, the problem with electrons and positrons is that they radiate energy. They need an enormous collider. In fact, to reach the Z mass, you'd probably need a collider about 27 kilometers around. And while we have one of those now, in fact, it started as an electron-positron collider to study the Z, back in the late 70s, that was completely out of the question and was a completely ludicrous uh, idea, way beyond uh, what the funding would allow. Now, CERN had recently constructed uh, the super proton synchrotron that could accelerate protons up to 400 GeV, giga electron volts. And so the idea was hatched. What about producing antiprotons? And then you could inject the antiprotons into the uh, SPS accelerator. They would accelerate in the opposite direction to the protons, and then you can focus them down and collide them at some point on the ring and have an experiment there to study the interactions. The problem was is that producing antiprotons was a messy business. What you did, it was easy to produce, you just smashed protons into a target, but you didn't get many antiprotons out. And when you did produce the antiprotons, they came out with a whole range of trajectories. And nobody knew how to, you know, correct those trajectories to make them go in a nice collimated beam. And that was where there was a great idea that came from Simon van der Meer. What he did was he came up with a scheme called stochastic cooling. So you smash your protons onto the target, antiprotons or a small number of antiprotons are produced the other side, and you measure their position um, and their trajectories so that you know what you need to do to correct them. The problem is, is by the time you've measured them and figured out what you need to do to correct them, they're traveling at basically the speed of light and you know, they're going around the accelerator ring. So what he did was he then took a signal across the accelerator ring. So it was going across a diameter while the particles were going around the circumference. So it got the signal to the correcting uh, mechanism, the correcting plate, arrived before the antiprotons did, and he could kick the antiprotons in the right direction to bring their trajectories in line with the beam. Now, this was a slow process. There was lots of measure, kick, measure, kick, measure, kick, to slowly adjust and cool the beam down until you had a beam of antiprotons all traveling in a nice circular orbit. But 
Although it took hours to do, and any failure anywhere meant you lost all of the antiprotons you'd accumulated, the scheme worked. And they converted the SPS, the superproton synchrotron, into the SPP bar S. They turned it into a proton antiproton collider with an 800 GV center of mass energy. And so it was in 1982, the UA1 and UA2 experiments announced the discovery of the W and Z bosons. What happens is you collide the proton and antiproton together. If it produces a Z, it kicks out two high energy muons or high energy electrons into the detector, which come out as nice straight tracks. And if you produce a W, it just produces one very high energy electron or muon track. And so the W and Z bosons were confirmed to exist. But the problems were not over there, because now that we knew the W and Z bosons exist, we needed to explain why they had a mass. Now the final piece of the standard model was the Higgs boson. Now the reason this was needed was to explain why the W and the Z had masses. And the reason them having a mass was a problem was because, as the uh, German mathematician Emily Noether showed in what I would argue is one of the most beautiful pieces of mathematics, that, um, and what she showed was that if you have a symmetry, uh, your system has a symmetry, there is an associated conservation law. And so the opposite also applies. If you've got a conservation law, your system has to have a symmetry. Now the problem is, is that the symmetries of the weak force that we've observed correspond to a, a symmetry that requires the W and the Z bosons to have no mass. And obviously that's a problem because they've one of some of the most massive particles out there. So how to resolve the problem? Well, way back in 1964, a guy named Higgs working at Edinburgh University came up with a solution. And what he suggested was that there was a scalar field. Now, this is different to any other field you've ever seen. All of our fields, gravitational field, electric field, all of these are, well, at least classical gravity field, is a vector field, right? So if you think about a magnetic field, there is always a direction to the magnetic field because it produces a force and that force obviously has to have a direction because it's a vector. A scalar field would be more like a temperature gradient, right? There's no, uh, there's a value of it at every point in space, but there's no direction to it. And that's what the Higgs field is. But the Higgs field is even weirder than that, because unlike every other fundamental field, if you take all the energy out, you, you let the Higgs field go to its lowest energy point, the value of the field is not zero. Right? So you take all the energy out of an electric field, it goes to zero. Take all the energy out of a Higgs field, and it drops to a non-zero value. And when it does that, it breaks the sim it spontaneously breaks the symmetry of the universe. So Higgs' solution was not to say, you know, that the symmetries of the forces are in there. That's why we observe the conservation laws we, we see. We, you know, the, the weak force obeys those symmetries but it's acting in a universe where that symmetry is broken. The environment breaks the symmetry. So a simple sort of example of that would be is if you lived on the side of a mountain and you've no knowledge of anywhere else but the side of the mountain, you might conclude that you know, Newton's second law is not a, a symmetry of nature because, of course, it takes a lot more force to produce the same acceleration going up and a lot less force takes to produce the same acceleration going down the mountain. And so that would be an example where the environment you're in, this sloped land, breaks the uh, sort of classical symmetry of Newton's second law. And so, you know, obviously Newton's second law would still have that symmetry, but, you know, it would look different simply because of the environment. And so that was Higgs' solution. Now, Higgs predicted that that meant that you would have a massive scalar boson that became known as the Higgs boson, and that would couple to the particles you know, in proportion to their mass. So the heavier the particle, the stronger it coupled to the Higgs field. 
and that of course made it difficult to produce because if you have a uh, you need to produce massive particles to produce the Higgs and in fact it was so hard to produce that Leon Lederman when he was writing a book before the Higgs was discovered about trying to find the Higgs want, wanted to call it the goddamned particle because it was so hard to find um, his publishers thought that was too blasphemous for a US audience and so they changed it to the god particle to the groan of particle physicists around the globe. Although uh, it is true uh, for the Catholics out there that like God uh, you can't have mass without the Higgs boson. So the Higgs boson was finally found at the Large Hadron Collider by the Atlas and CMS experiments on the 4th of July 2012. And we found it uh, by its mechanism for decaying into two photons, which is somewhat unusual for a, f a particle that couples to mass, but what happens is it couples to top quarks in a loop, and then those two co top quarks essentially sort of an annihilate to produce two photons. So that was it. The standard model was finally complete. Now, while the standard model is complete, particle physics is far, far from complete. Just like the discovery of the W and the Z raised a question about where their masses came from, the discovery of the Higgs has raised another serious problem with the standard model, and that is, why is the Higgs so light? There's something called the fine-tuning or hierarchy problem that requires additional physics to explain why the Higgs mass is far, far below the Planck scale where gravity becomes important. And in fact, that easily introduces another flaw in the standard model. The standard model has no explanation for gravity. That's still missing. But perhaps the one that's gripping uh, you know, physics the most at the moment is the nature of dark matter. And for that, the standard model has no particle that agrees with the properties that astronomers tell us dark matter has to have. So there's still lots of physics out there that is undiscovered. The standard model is by far from a complete model, but that's the end of our history. The rest is future, and maybe it's up to some of you to write it. Yeah.